Hello, this is Robert Rodriguez, and I'm going to try and show you in 10 minutes how we did the effects in Spy Kids 2. How do you save money and still maintain a big vision? Well, let's take a look. In this scene, I wanted the parents to be looking for their kids with this big ship, sort of a high-tech underwater Winnebago. Mom's on one side of the ship with her own steering wheel and controls. Dad has his own controls. But I didn't want to have to actually build this big set. I didn't even want to build two steering wheels, because right there I would have doubled my budget for this set. So as the production designer and the director of photography, I conspired to pull off this little low-tech stunt. I only built one chair, one wall, and one steering wheel. Now, Dad has to look over at Mom in the same shot, but what we did was approximate where she'd be sitting if she were in her own chair, and we marked the floor and stood her on that mark. And when it came time to shoot Mom's part of the conversation, I had Mom and Dad switch places. So now Dad is in her position, and she's in his. Then I flopped her image and composited her back into the original shot. So now it looks like he's looking at her, and she's got her own seat, when actually they're sitting in the same chair. Here they are again. We shoot him sitting, then we shoot her sitting there, flop her shot, and instantly, he just doubled the size of the set. Honey, it works. Whoa. Hard to believe. People ask me why I like to do all these different jobs. Well, look how much fun it is figuring all this out. Ah! For shots like this of the kids falling, I just put them in front of the green screen on wires. I know when we're shooting that all I really need is a little wind and some slight camera movement so it feels like the kids and the cameraman are falling together. The extra turbulence, the extra wind, smoke, etc. I'm going to add that in later, so no need to bother with that now. I wanted them to look like they were falling in these very comfortable positions, almost reclining. So my physical effects guys built these metal plates that were curved for the kids to lay down on so it would curve their bodies the right way and they'd look bored and, you know, comfortably lazy. For things like underwater shots, just use slow motion, some wind. They're not even moving. The camera is actually moving towards them and under them. For this scene in the big silent room, I wanted the kids to walk into this giant cavern with a huge golden statue. Of course, with my budget, I didn't want to have to build this giant set. So instead, what we did is we built a miniature and shot it ourselves in between takes of the kids. You know, usually on a regular movie, you have a whole other unit shooting miniatures. But we did all of this with the A unit. For this scene, the kids walk into a giant treasure room with skeletons hanging on the walls all the way up to the ceiling. What you see here is all we built. I knew we could paint in the rest of the set for this one establishing shot. It shows the audience they're in this big room so that for the rest of the scene, as the photographer, I just have to frame them within the two walls of my partial set. You don't need to see the full big room again. You already know it's there. What a waste of money it would have been to have built that whole set. But should we have built it bigger if we could? No. Why? Well, look, as the kids leave the room, they return to the same room, and as the editor, what do I use? A closer shot of them. Why not show the big room again? Well, because we've already seen it. You don't even need to see it again. This will show you how far I'll go to save money. See this big underground volcano thingy, right? See all the rock formations back there? I'd probably need about 25 big rock formations to make this set work because we're, we're shooting it from all different angles. But I know what I can get away with. So how many big rocks did we build? 25? Nope, we built three and we built them on wheels. So there they are behind Romero. But now when we cut to another angle, back there, those are the same three rocks. We just rolled them over there and I lit them different. The set ended up costing eight times less because we didn't build the entire set. And this is just one example, but this is sort of the philosophy that follows over in every scene, on every set, in every department for this movie. Fun, huh? The story is supposed to take place on a mysterious island, but for logistical and budget reasons, I shot it all in Texas. But I did want some great sort of coastline shots, so I figured out as the editor which shots I would use of a coastline and where. So at the end of the entire shoot, we went to Costa Rica for a couple days with a small crew and the main children in the movie, and we got some shots of them on the beach, a few shots of the waterfall. So here's a shot of Carmen in beautiful Costa Rica. She walks off camera, and now she's in Austin, Texas for the rest of the movie, down in a riverbed. We've now established the new location, and now whenever anyone runs down to the beach, this is where they'll be in Austin, because you've already seen the coastline, so that's in your head. For a scene like this, I did a drawing to sketch out what I had written in this script, which is of Junie lifting a monkeys out of a barrel. I liked the drawing, it was very moody, so as the production designer, I gave Romero a way to dim the lights, so that everything becomes backlit. Now, looking at the drawing, the thing that struck me was, you couldn't see the monkeys really, they were mostly in shadow, but you could understand what they were by their shape. By lighting it in this way, where the side closer to the camera is darker, we saved a lot of time and money later when we were doing the effects. Unbelievable! See that smoke rising up from the volcano? Doesn't exist. See those nice clouds in the sky? We weren't so lucky on the day of shooting. But that's okay, you can easily add those in. The shot is locked off, so it's easy to add. Oh, and while we're at it, I added in the volcano too. There's me on the left. We shot this in the parking lot. As the production designer, I'm only building 
partial set. So you see that little sliver of a set over there? I built that so that when they were crawling up the volcano, I can do this shot here. See how carefully I'm framing it so it's not to go off the sides? This sliver also gives us a great visual reference of how the rock would react to sunlight. It's amazing how far along technology has come. Making shots like this is now a basic Photoshop job. This is another cool building in San Antonio, but I wanted to make it the main OSS building. That's what I did for most of the effects. Having a reference is always good. This shot of Carmen spinning the spoons, all I had her really do was hold the spoons up, start to spin them, and then she drops them. And then she pretends like she's still spinning them. That way we can transition to CG spoons on the spin so it's harder to spot the effect. I really love the hairstyle that Emily Osmond had. And on this day, I thought of her uh, hair spinning like propellers. So, um... I tied her hair together to get it away from her face, but I also spun them around to get a, a really good reference to my effects guys. Nothing too technical. I don't like to get overly technical with this sort of thing because you can get away with quite a lot these days. And it's easy to start getting lost in all the measurements, angle, degree of tilt, overabundance of technical red tape. So for a shot like this, where she's supposed to be up in a tall tree, I know how quickly this shot's going to pass and how much blur there'll be in it. So on the green screen, I had Carmen actually just standing up, and she comes up from behind it. And I do sort of a, a zoom thing on it, you know, kind of fast. Then when we go outside much later, we put a smaller nest up in a tall tree to make the tree look bigger. And I just set the camera where it looked nice, and I did a fast zoom back from the tree. No measurements, lens size comparisons, nothing like that. The blur of the fast zoom covered this sort of scale inconsistencies. Oh. The more you know about what you can do later, you can save a lot of time on set and not make a big production out of an effect shot. Now here's a really good example of why I've chosen to do production design. Because so much of the movie now is being done in post. And I knew I would still be needing set designs done all the way through the editing of the movie. And on a regular movie, the production designer goes away after you finish shooting, if not even before. Now that I'm doing the job, I can save a lot of design work for later in editing when I have a much better sense of what I need. So shooting the movie becomes much easier. For this scene, I made a really quick sketch of what, of what I wanted the set to look like. An office that's so big that there was no way we could even build a part of it. Nailed down some boxes covered in green for Mike Judge to jump on. And much later, while I'm in editing, I can finish designing the set. And even though I was locked into Mike entering the frame here because of the size of our green screen, with the computer, we can pull back to show off even more of the room. For these shots of the kids out on the ocean, they were actually shot on the lake near my house in Austin, right off the boat dock. The kids are in these fiberglass shells and they're tied to the dock. All we had to do was erase the strip of land behind them. We add in the sea creature, and uh, for effect shots like these, my effects guys make animatics out of my storyboards. They almost like a low res video game. So we can see how wide the camera needs to be to see the creature we add in later, to give the children an eye line of where they need to look in order to make it appear as if they're looking at the creature. One last thing, for in this scene, the skeleton battle, it's a very physical scene. Could easily have taken several days to shoot. What I did was just give them a basic sword choreography to do. And I had them repeat the moves over and over while I moved the camera on a small crane with a wide angle, whipping it all around. Months later, I would then edit together the best, most dynamic shots, then really study the footage to figure out where I would place the skeletons and what their action would be. For instance, in this take, I noticed that Carmen swung her fist twice. So I thought, hmm, maybe she can hit a skeleton, make his head spin around, and then with her second hit, she can knock his head off. Here, I thought Junie could knock a skeleton's head off, and then he puts it back on. But of course, since I'm figuring this out later, you don't see him react to it at all because he doesn't know it's going to happen. I don't even know how long a big scene like this would take normally in a regular movie. We shot it in a few hours because they're just repeating their moves, I'm moving the camera around, and I'm putting in all the action later. Rather than going after specific actions that would have taken us a long time to get each take, I just got an overall coverage, cut it together, and create a lot of the action details later. Okay, well, as fast as I was talking, I think our 10 minutes is over. Hope you enjoyed it. If nothing else, this will give you ideas on how you can have a lot of creative fun on your own movies. And if you want to go make movies, those little digital video cameras are great. They do a lot. Make movies, but then also edit them. Being good at editing is important because it will help you in all the other areas. You'll figure out what you can do, what you can get away with, what you don't need. So be creative. Have fun. Good luck. Bye-bye.